I'm Gentleman Josh Hill. I'm Aaron Jeffrey. I'm Jasmine Jasmine Busiest. I'm Mike Malak. I'm Rafi on Stop. Tune into the Don't Tap. Don't Tap. Don't Tap. Don't Tap Podcast. Don't Tap Podcast. John Jones. Follow me on Twitter. Hey, I'm UFC President Dana White, and you're in the ring with Callum McGregor. To be the Lions are the number one rankings out there. Those guys are the ones who really do their homework. Man, no, once I've been, the rankings are bullshit. <laughs> From Canada. Got a really high fight IQ. For this fight, I'm telling you, it's a flip of a coin. I levels to the shit. So many high level guys. So like the line is crazy. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, no, we're good. See, he's a pro. Eyes on the TV. And the second mm-hmm. he sees something, he just You get that feel or that moment where there's a and you see like, wait a minute, I could see this going like this for the rest of the fight, or the time yeah. starts to turn, or just like a guy backs up, doesn't like a shot a certain way. Or even with Durden, man, like, like, as Billy's saying, like, the price tag on Durden, like, people are still seem like they're live betting uh, Hadley after the first round. So, like, yeah, he was people still definitely plus were money. betting live betting Hadley in that second round. And then after he got it out of that sub, I feel like that's a that's a confidence booster. Hadley looked gassed. I feel yeah. like that's the way the cap is. Like, you could just tell by a fighter if they're starting to fatigue out. I'm always worried about Durden. Man. Mentally, he's not. Sorry, go ahead. Unless I'm always worried about Durden in the third round. Like, that's always where I'm like, because he tends to gaslight like, because he's so aggressive. But, man, like, have you seen the shit he was talking on Hadley? Like, he hated that guy. So I'm like, even with a bad gas tank, I'm like, he's still going to go out there and punch him in the face. Yeah, I know that no sub, like that arm bar, he pretty much had the triangle lock too. If he doesn't have that triangle lock, he probably does actually sink that arm bar in and take the arm. I know it killed Clint. But Clint's got to look at it like this, man. When that guy's been hitting everything he's been hitting, and he puts out a sub parlay every week, and it hits yeah. one of ten times, then fuck it. Or one of whatever times it, you need to hit to hit it, fuck, man. He cashed huge last week, so I think, or the, the, the event before that. So uh, it is what it is, man. Hopefully that didn't hurt him too much. But, I mean, yeah, Durden, I think, was the only sharp sniff I had all week, man. Um, I got my ass kicked, and you know what goes up must come down as I posted uh, I was doing pretty hot, and I think that if Wells had come through in the fights, I still would have had a pretty Yeah, good if game. Wells would have came Wells through. come through, I don't, you know, I mean, Wells doesn't come through. Then I'm now looking at my dogs, and now there's more weight on Damon Jackson. Damon Jackson turns out to be, I still think, a, a sharper play, at least from the value that was there, him as a dog. It goes to the judges. You're wondering what's going on. But the fact that Wells doesn't hit, the fact that, you know, I was way off on Tucker and, and hats off to you guys on that one. Although you guys are talking about age and certain factors, the biggest factor, the jiu-jitsu, uh, Lopez just or, or Lopes, however you say his name, God damn it. Um, he's grabbing that arm, corralling that arm in as he's getting taken down by Tucker. He's corralling that arm in and taking it right like it was already gone the moment he went for that takedown. He starts just working towards it, triangle in and out, the arms there, and flips him over and, and breaks that. I mean, with Tucker's win condition sort of being takedowns, and that's what I'm leaning on and leaning on, and then we have a high-level jiu-jitsu guy, I missed the boat huge on that one, and I, I got to own up to that one. Um, if there's ones where, like a, like a Jackson, everybody can kick rocks if they're still fading me on that one, I, I'd take that bet again. You guys are really sharp on that one, so hats off to you. But how was your guys' week? I mean, I, I had a rough one. I'm going to have a bounce back. And Dana White Contender Series is where I start to get, you know, digging in a little bit. So um, have at it, guys. What do you, how was your uh, week, and how was your, your bets? Um, it was a pretty good week for uh, actually no, I, I should say it was one of those weeks where uh, it started off really good in the PFL. PFL was money in the bank. I uh, lost yeah. a little bit at the end of the night with Bubba Jenkins upset, but then we got into the UFC card and it was just uh, sometimes the fight game goes in your favor where you get a couple bounces going your way. And then uh, last week I felt like uh, the same exact bounces that had been going my way just didn't go my way. Jeremiah Wells minus 1,800 going into the third round ends up getting submitted in the third round. And uh, Nashio Batamundes, two-leg parlay, ended up burning me. And um, that was really that was really the story of the weekend. I mean, everything else live was straight. Um, hit the Asu play. Shouts to you guys. Uh, you guys kind of talked me into that one a little bit. Asu minus uh, 155. Yeah, shouts to Nick, man. The Sue minus 155 money line uh, for – or sub-decision minus 155. We talked about the money line. It was minus 155. And then I actually prop, brought me into the sub-prop, which was plus 650. That was a missed spot I felt bad about. Like, that That was a missed spot for sure. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Sue did good for me, man. I had the sub-prop as well. Um, so I cashed on both those tickets there. And then um, Jacoby, my dog of the week, 
came through without a problem whatsoever, man. I wish I had more faith in it. It's just everybody in the world that I was talking to was like, Kennedy's going to start him. And, you know, literally first punch he pretty much throws knocks Kennedy on his Bro, ass. That was the most ring. That was the most ringed fights and ringed fights I've seen in a minute. I mean, granted, Justin Jacoby, a lot of his weight condition was that first round knockout. But man, dude, he made that. That was a that was a bad scripted fight. Well, I don't even know because if, if you look at Kennedy, man, like the Dong Jung fight, it was kind of like the same thing. Like he got hit with like an elbow that barely looked like it landed, and he just fell on the ground. So I don't know, man. Like that's the second time where sketchy things have happened whenever he's. Yeah, like, man. I mean, I've you know we've been on Jacoby big. I think everybody's been sort of on Jacoby up until recently, where we're you know that sketchy split decision loss that he won, and then his last fight where just, I just don't know what happened. He, he looks labored at the end of fights, but, man, he just came out. He does have high-precision striking. He is a big guy, and when he sits down on his punches, you know, he was back up against the cage and just he lands those shots and, and puts them out. So some sharp plays, some uh, some losses. I don't hate Sandhagen for doing what he did. Um, I know that now that tries to come to out now, he has to drive the terror. But I mean, the dude came out, took down a guy who is a solid striker, probably not a better striker than him, maybe a better boxer than him. And he takes him down to the ground and dominates him on the ground. Like, fuck, who gives a fuck? The man went out and did exactly what he was supposed to do. If you have a Sandhagen ticket, I just agree. a line, you're laughing, you're, you're, you're or he's finishing off your parlays, you're loving it, you're clapping all the way to the bank on that one. Dana White's saying it wasn't entertaining, but fuck, what's the guy supposed to do? Even if the tricep tear wasn't there and he came out and exploited a win condition, good on him, man. H have at it. I don't need to see. I agree with you, kid. You're getting a guy on short notice. You know there's the easiest way to win the fight. You want to be a wrestler now? Well, now you're going to have to face the wrath of the wrestlers at the top of the division, the Marab Davishilis of the world. So uh, I think that's the next fight for Corey Sanhagen. It's probably going to be like one of those wrestler I type fights to Marab Davishilis or something like that because I think Dana White's going to try to punish him, show him the Dana White privilege about uh, Sound good. Do it. I love it. I love that role. Put him in that spot, sort of barred up against the UFC. Um, and he's like one of the best social media. He's funny as hell. But I mean, he, what I, I messaged him, not that he's going to message back, but if he does, you know I'm trying to get him on the podcast. But when, when it comes down to his wrestling, he got high-level wrestling practice for five rounds in a main event under the lights. Yeah, There's no yeah. better level up than that. You know, honestly, like I said this for a while, like this is the UFC's fault that you get fights like this, though, because you're telling a guy that if he loses, he's losing 50% of his money. So why would he not go out there and take the path of least resistance? Like that is their fault. And then they try and to run away. And What's he's on the leg, too, because like he's really at this teetering point, right? Like he could yeah. be the next big thing as far as being the number one contender again and push himself back into that talk. But if he loses any fight, it's like he's sort of – there's too many guys. There's too many killers. That he's gonna I think that should that. IQ is saying, hey, can you practice your wrestling and your offensive wrestling, defensive wrestling, the whole entire camp against Umar. You get the short notice replacement, and now you're like, well, I've just been working on all this wrestling shit. Now I can use this as offensive wrestling, and boom, that's exactly what happened. Uh, four or five decision, plus 110. That was a great way to get around the money line. Uh, my question for you boys is, uh, what is your guys' opinion about that Jake Paul and Nate Diaz fight to end out the weekend? <laughs> I wish I bet. Man, I don't know. I, like, I, I wish, like, I said, like, oh, Jake Paul's going to win decision. I don't know why he's favored for the KO. And I just didn't bet it. Instead, you know, I had a couple beers with me after the UFC event, and I put 50 bucks on Nate Diaz. So I can't say it was. Dude, yeah, I, I was mostly on Paul by decision, um, Diaz round 9 and 10, because if the crazy cardio dump did happen, if Diaz was going to volume him and finally knock somebody out with his hands, um, I mean, it was going to be then. So I just thought, why not take a shot on that? I mean, his line did go decent. And I know like pre-fight, he was he was throwing some some shadow boxing in the back room and everybody was, the line was starting to move a little bit because of that. Even in the chat, we were talking about it. But I mean, yeah, Paul just looked good, man. But I even think uh, in MMA, you know, with some hands, you, if, if, if they make him, if they make that line <laughs> wide enough, I might take Jake Paul. Nah, is that cat or not cat? Are they if this next fight is in MMA, I'm betting Nate Diaz by solid. Oh, dude, he has well, you have to hit that for Nate sure. Brown. That's gonna be a, a bet for sure. Yeah. But all I'm saying is is if the big Jake Paul comes in and slams him around a little bit, maybe lands a big shot. Like I, I don't know, man. I, I'm just nah, saying if the line's crazy nah, wide. Levels to this ground shit. I think Nate Diaz oh, I'm very aware. Eight so year old Nate Diaz sense. probably submits Jake Paul. <laughs> Nate Diaz already put him. I hate Jake Paul. I'm not. I'm not backing. I just like value. 
And if there's a, a, a real good value on a, a puncher's chance, then I will I'll jump on that shit. So looking at the UFC Fight Night card that is coming up, this seems to be a card. This is one of those cards that sort of put some fights together that fell off some cards and trying to get people those, you know, those typical last fights that they, they promised them and reschedules and all this. It's a mixed mash of dangerous. Um, but there is a couple angles. Before we get into that, though, moving forward, Dana White Contender Series is going to be every Tuesday. I implore you guys the best way you can. You're busy as hell. I know it. Um, to try to get one pick for the Dana White Contender Series as we come into the uh, to the podcast. That way we can have a pick going into Tuesday. And there was something I did last year that worked out really well for me, and I'm going to show you this week that, that sort of played out well, is pick one guy from the Dana White Contender Series, parlay him up with one of your picks from the weekend coming up. It just sort of inflate or it sort of gives you a number, a better number, um, especially if your your favorite wins going into the Dana White Contender Series. So um, I do have a pick. Um, taking a look at Tom Nolan and Bogdan Grad. Um, you know, obviously that's the first thing that jumps out, I think, at almost everybody up. The closest one of the closer lines, but we got plus money on Bogdan Grad just now. It's actually sitting at about it was sitting at plus one hundred, now it's at plus one thirty. And I think the biggest reason is the volume and the size, and I and I totally get that. Um Tommy Nolan comes in with this sort of mauling kid in the candy store approach where he's just crazy with his strikes, so it's high volume. But there's so many holes. Like there's so many holes. Like there's a, there's a lot there, um, and really when it comes down to Bogdan Grad, he's totally the polar opposite. Well, to try to close that distance on the size right now, he's going to really need to knock on the door and come with a little bit higher volume and, and really he's going to have to at least throw two to three punch combinations to actually close that distance. But I think even playing a counter game on uh, Nolan, who's going to come in with high volume, and we have the higher precision striker in Bogdan. Um, this guy lands. You know, he's, he's got, he's got his, everybody's seen the spinning wheel kick that I'm sure has tried to cap him and see, seeing the spinning wheel, wheel kick knockout and he throws those throughout his fights as well too. Does have some takedowns as well too. And Nolan's exposed on the takedowns. I, I did see that. Although he does have some scrambles, he can be sort of taken down and, and held down and he sort of leaves his hips there. You don't have to have great entries to actually land a, a takedown on him. So I just think that there's, there's paths here. I think that uh, I might even take a look at what the KO looks like because I just think that this with Dana White Contender Series, you're almost better. It's so volatile. Like you think you have it all locked and loaded as to how the matchup's going to play out. Everybody's looking at the volume of Nolan. They're going to come in and maul him. But I just think this is one of those spots. I'll take the plus money on the guy, especially looking at the full lineup and the list. Um, but this is the time when you look at those dogs at plus 200 and say, is he really a plus 200 dog? Because they hit. They hit I don't game. know though, Cal. I, watching the weigh-ins today for the Dana White Contender Series, that was the biggest significant thing that I saw. Six three five nine. nine. That motherfucker look huge compared. They look like they're in two different weight classes. I don't know if I want to pull the dog shot here on uh, Bergman Grad. I think skills wise, he has more skills than Tom Nolan. It's just sometimes skills don't really matter on the Dana White Contender Series. It's about can you peak on that night? Can you impress the boss that night in that one moment? Um, one fight that I was looking at on the Dana White Contender Series was the main event, Cesar Almeida versus Lucas Fernando. Uh, that was the biggest thing that stood out to me on the whole entire card was My the parlor. two in that one. Uh, that one would open up at minus 300, came down to minus 225, and deservedly so. Uh, uh, nothing against Cesar Almeida. He has a decorated kickboxing record of 47-8 and eight with 27 knockouts. He has power in his hands. I don't really read too much in his 3-0 you know, MMA record. I mean, the people that he was fighting were like 5-28, and 28. Zero and zero, zero and zero. So, um, what I get it, he could strike, but what happens when a dude shoots a single leg or pushes him up against the cage? Uh, we see Alex Pereira, who trains with Glover Tixera, who's one of the best decorated kickboxers from Glory MMA, uh, somebody that Almeida has beaten before in the past. Uh, his cage grappling does not look that good at all. I can't imagine how good your cage grappling is going to look against an LFA, uh, LFA middleweight champion here in Lucas Fernando. Um, he fights at a refit pro fighters. Uh, Fernando is coached by UFC pride strike force legend, Pedro Rizzo uh, coming out of the same section as uh, Ryan Barcelos um, last week. So I think uh, Brazil's got another prospect here. This dude's nine and one um, three KOs in his last fight. Uh, he went the distance, I believe. And it was a five-round fight. He's fought five rounds before. That's something that you usually don't see on the Dana White Contender Series. A lot of these prospects aren't really that proven with gas tanks and stuff like that. And that's the story on a lot of the other fights. But um, I think Lucas Fernando is going to put together a nice performance and win the fight. Does he get the contract? 
Probably so, just because it's the main event and Dana White was uh, on his Oprah. You get a contract, you get a contract last year. But um, I definitely think uh, Lucas Fernando, I'm looking at that play straight at FanDuel, minus 225. It's coming down a little bit chalky, but um, I think it's chalky for a reason. Uh, if you look at the Dana White Contender Series history in the past of the age gap difference between fighters, 10-year age gap or more, uh, it favors the younger fighter very very, very significantly. And that's the biggest age gap that you're going to see on the card this weekend. And uh, one potential dog shot to even out the juice odds for the weekend. Uh, I haven't pulled the trigger on it. I wanted to get your guys' opinion. So we got Kevin Boros versus Victor Diaz. Um, Kevin Boros, this is his third opponent here. And we got Victor Diaz, Titan FC, flyweight champion. And he's coming in here on somewhat short notice. And he's coming in here at minus 400. I get it. It's a striker versus grappler type of matchup. And I usually lean towards the grappler. But can Kevin Boros defend some takedowns? I mean, we've seen some Peruvian fighters on the regional scene uh, come up here in the UFC despite what their regional scene competition looks like. I mean, eight knockouts at the flyweight division, 100% knockout uh, rate at the flyweight division definitely catches my eye at plus 290. And that's not a bad spot. I believe that's the first – is that the first fight of the night? Yeah, first fight. They have so, I mean, for you, like, to take that shot, and I, I, I think that is – a line that should be a little bit closer based on just a little bit that you see between the two. And I get the short notice as well. Um, definitely there's value 100% in that. Um, so, and then the idea that, you know, if you miss the dog shot as the first fight of the night, there's still four more, uh, you know, bets out there. If you haven't placed any other bets yet, um, I'm with you on the Fernando side of things. I actually uh, parlayed him up with Khalil Roundtree. I think Khalil Roundtree is going to dust Dawkins. We'll talk about that uh, a little later. I'm sure someone might be on that. I just think those are two like more solid spots on both cards. Um, Fernando just way more well-rounded coming in against, you know, with his opponent, it's just, it is kickboxing. And when you see, um, him get in on those hips, once Fernando gets there, it's, it's a minus 400, it's minus 450 at that point. Once he gets to the ground, it's just a wrap. I think, um, there's just a, a well-rounded MMA fighter versus a kickboxer with some substance and some dynamic striking. He's dangerous. He's scary, but I just don't think that's going to really matter. I think, uh, you know, we see a grounded opponent that, that gets taken out pretty, pretty handily. So, um, solid cap on that one. The straight bet is pretty, you know, with it, it's more, you know, for, it's all going to depend on who's listening, right? If you have a decent, solid bankroll, that's that's a sort of a, a chalkier bet on the Dana Tension Series. Throw that down 100%. Make that a bet for the night. Uh, that way you're, you know, walking with some money at the end of the night. Um, but if you're looking to parlay things up, take that Dana White Contender Series, parlay it into the UFC fight night. There's a lot out there too. There's Bellator as well too. If you, you want to take a, you know, a chalkier favorite on Bellator and pair it up. 14 just, fights on Bellator this weekend. Dude. That's a lot of fucking fights. Yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going down a path I didn't want to because I'm going to get made fun of for it. But when you give me the crazy plus money, we'll talk about it at the end. It's not one of my plays on the podcast, but it's something I, I got to, you know, highlight to people because it's just a crazy line and people parlay that shit. Yo, Josh, I'll like, fuck you all. So, anyways, we'll get back to that in a little bit. In our group chat, um, we we're literally like making bets on how quickly Callum was going to bet on Josh Hill. Well, I see, I, I didn't want to, man. I really like between, <laughs> we'll get into that too, but we'll finish on Daniel White Industries. But even between um, Aaron Jeffrey and between him and Josh, um, I'll, I'll get into it at the end. That, that I like when I break it down for you, you can be like, well, yeah, that sort of makes sense. And if you're going to try to parlay the guy, that's all I'm going to talk people off. Like, don't you want to make your straight bets? You see an angle on it. We'll, we'll get into it. But I mean, there's just I got a question for different. you uh, before we hop off the Dana White Contender Series topic. You know, stay on um, again. How do you guys feel about the Peyton Talibit versus Re Reyes Cortez fight? You got Talibit coming out of uh, Uriah Favors. Uh, fight organization. I believe he's the Bantamweight champion over there. And then we got Reyes Cortez coming out of fight ready MMA. Is yeah. Reyes Cortez going to wrestle? That's the question. I don't, I don't know. If, does, I don't know. Man, if you look at Talbot, man, like even like he gets taken down fairly easily, but he sprawls and gets right back to his feet. And yeah. I think his cockiness, his arrogance, like I heard another guy comment saying that he kind of has the Sean O'Malley effect to him, the way he just shows that arrogance in the cage, which I do have to agree with. Um, and I think that even if he does get taken down, he's going to be able to get back up to his feet and just style on this guy. And the reason for the arrogance is the striking. I mean, so yeah, yeah I, I, was, I, was initially on, I was initially on Cortez, but um, I've been going back and forth on that one. Yeah. Talbot is the pick for me on that one. Um, so I think most people are on the right side of that one. I just think it's going to be a difference. Another one I didn't want to jump to because it's alpha male and I've seen to be an alpha male guy at this point too. So I got to try to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to steer clear of some picks as well too, but uh but yeah, no, I think that's the bottom of the 
biggest line movement on the card since the weigh-ins earlier today was uh, Kyle Machado versus Kevin Sterlansky. Uh, Sterlansky was supposed to fight on the Dana White Contender Series last year. Didn't end up getting that spot, but uh, now he's coming in here. And uh, I think the reason why a lot of people are betting uh, Kevin here is the a little bit of a uh, weight advantage. Uh, it mm -hmm. doesn't look like Kyle Machado is a true heavyweight, and it looks like Kevin is definitely a true heavyweight. Uh, that line was around minus 125 on the openers, and that went all the way up to minus 175, so about uh, 50 cents of line movement towards the favor here. Do you guys agree with it? Yeah, if you look at uh, so, you know, see, this is one of the ones I went back and forth on, and I definitely think Machado is live early. But if you look at the people he's faced, man, there's a guy on his record named Lee Main that is 56 years old that he's beat twice. I wanted so to stay off. That, 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 that's man. Jordan Main's dad um, out of Alberta. I wanted to just try to stay off that, even the conversation itself. Um, but yeah, it's uh, as much as Machado is extremely high level jujitsu. Um, the record right now, we got to take a look at it, honestly. And that's why I stayed off it. I wanted to be a homer because he is Canadian, essentially Brazilian Canadian. Um, but yeah, I sort of stayed off that one. It's going to be more of a show me spot. Cause I don't know much, enough about the other guy. He looks like a little bit of a killer. So it's going to be interesting. But I mean, if this gets to the ground, it's grounded. It's, it's, it's not, I think. And it's honestly, man, he finishes everything in the first round. So I think yeah. it's going to be one round or boss. If you look it's at more Kevin, of a show me like, spot, man. Yeah. And like, at the end of the day, I said, like, if you can get those props man like you'll probably get round one's finish at a good line and that's just that's probably his win condition in this fight because kevin will slow the fight down you hold him up against the cage that's how the size difference will be there slowly start to work on those takedowns and to be honest i think he wins a relatively boring decision like i don't see this fight being overly exciting yeah i know i'm uh like i said stay off for me there's a reason why it was a pick em, um because it's just not enough to know um but I, like, like I said, I'll stick with the Fernando play. I think it's one of our stronger plays. I think, you know, as far as, uh, you know, Billy's on it, Nick's pretty much, uh, you know, with it as well, too. And I've already yeah. parlayed, parlayed him up with Roundtree at minus 103. Um, the line's and coming down a little on, bit. Let me finish on the Bogdan because I didn't get to finish up on that. Um, the last thing I'll say to you, if you were even looking at the Bogdan line, but the, the side is scaring you and you don't want to, you know, go at the plus 130. I think th what this is going to be a case of is you see a lot of finishes in Dana White Contender Series. It's going to be timing be beating speed. So if you're going to be on the Bogdan side, look for the KO right before pre-fight. See what the KO prop is. Um, he does have power in his hands. He does time his kicks really well. Um, and I think that's what we're going to see here. That's what I'm sort of looking at for the plus money. I'm sort of sort of, sort of banking on it. Might, it might be what I sort of ship to um, as a plus money KO. Because um, I just see that speed is great. But timing will be there. And I think that with this guy, it's the case in this scenario. So um, just a little thought to, to finish that off. But I think uh, I'm pretty happy. I think we hit a lot of spots in the Danny White Contender Series. We've got a lot coming up, man. We got, we got, Smith we got Smotherman coming in next week. I'm excited for that, that pick. Um, I'm going to be on that almost right away. And uh, we got a couple of other guys coming out of Canada as well, too. Uh, Syracuse City is going to be one of the biggest favorites likely of the season. So, fuck, I can't cash on him. I was hoping he was going to be a secret, but apparently not. So um, let's d jump into the actual UFC picks. I'm going to let you guys sort of uh, lead it off. Uh, Billy, why don't you take it away? Yeah, first spot on the card. This one actually uh, made me double flash here. Um, this is what we like to call the Pubs for Trio, Gambler's First Glance. Mike Breeden versus Terrence McKinney. First glance, you would think, uh, why the – wait, what? Terrence McKinney's back on the fucking card. Uh, this is definitely the UFC setting up Terrence McKinney for a mm. W here, and I think it's going to come inside a distance pretty early. I like round one minus 125. Inside a distance is minus 210. FanDuel dropped the rounds one or two uh, KO props. I think this is a Terrence McKinney smash bot. 100%. And as you saw, that was on my early lean. Um, don't know what the, the – what, what's the line at right now for round one? Uh, round one is minus 125. Inside a distance is minus 210. Um Terrence McKinney minus three and a half on the spread is minus two sixty. So that's telling you everything you need to know on this yeah, one. Right uh, the there, money line right. is minus two seventy five. Yeah, I mean McKinney coming off of the loss to uh, you know Nas. I mean it was a submission, so we're not coming off a KO. Quick turnaround. Let's get him back in there, and, and he didn't look that bad at the beginning of the fight. Um, Breed had been KO'd in three of his five fight or uh, five losses. Sorry. So, I mean, he's hittable. And I back Breeden in the fight because he does have some decent boxing, but he's still hittable. And I think that once McKinney touches him on the chin, I think this is going to be early off. Like, it's going to be one or two, and that's it. 
Um, the lights are going to go out. I, I like McKinney round one or two, um, and I like the KO prop. But, I mean, it's going to be a McKinney early finish. We just got to find the value as the lines come out and see exactly where that is. But, I mean, you got a couple of good lines out there already. Um, I normally haven't backed McKinney just because of the, you know, the – Banger bust approach to his fights, but I think McKinney's the spot on this one. Uh, rounds one or two for sure. The KO looks good to me. Yeah, I don't share the same confidence you guys have. I definitely think he wins this fight, but I just Terrence McKinney's been a guy that's been all over the place. So taking the fight on relatively short notice, like I don't know if he's been in the gym since his last fight. Like a lot of these guys, once they win, you know. They're going right to the bar or they're going right to the fucking pizza pizza. Like they're just living their best life because they've been doing nothing but starving themselves. So I don't know what he's going to look like when he comes in. Like obviously the line reflects and most people will be thinking he's going to win. Um, and I said, I will side with it. It's just, this fight's kind of a no bet for me because I just like, I don't know where tennis mechanic is going to be at. But I said, if all the starts is him in the first round, the only thing that I would do is if this fight gets over a round and he My had, step. like, Brendan, like, dead to rights in the first round, I'm going to hit him going into the second round for sure. Because if for one thing's for sure, even on a full fight camp, McKenney doesn't have three rounds of cardio. So yeah, it that's, depends the on only, that's the only thing I see on this fight. As I said, like, I'd be very surprised if he didn't just win this one in the first. But it's the line's really wide for me. Just be careful with how you're like, just don't over measure his tiredness. Cause if he does even sort of have anything left in the tank, even a little bit in his tank could knock out Breeden. That's the only thing. Uh, oh, like, yeah, man, sure. There's so much power there. So, and yeah, Are like I said, I, I get it, man. I've like... off McKinney fights like crazy, but I just think that this is going to be one of those spots that it happens. You go, yep, that was supposed to happen. And you know, it's just sort of one of the easier caches. Um, but I mean, who knows? Breeden could come out, take a bunch of shots and we're like, what the fuck? Because we don't know what goes into some fight camps sometimes and, and what messes with guys and losses. So, But that's the fucking game we play, right? So, I think it's um, a little bit better that he's coming in on short notice. You want to get that nasty taste out of your mouth. And uh, as soon as he got that loss the next week, Kevin Holland, he, pulled, he went through the whole entire process for Kevin Holland. Kevin Holland looked amazing, career best. I mean, uh, that definitely got to give you like a boat of confidence and reinsurance that you're doing the right things and you made the right moves. Because uh, he had a little bit of problems with his camp. Uh, the fight before the last, I think it was the bomb team fight, his cornermen or whatever, uh, they're doing the wrestling practice drills and he ended up giving him a black eye. He almost had to pull out the fight or whatever. It was something weird where he uh, ended up firing his uh, team or whatever, and that's what made him move down to Texas. And then he didn't look too bad in the first round, but uh, maybe this is the fight – you know how sometimes with fighters, they lose that first fight when they switch camps, and then the second, third, fourth fight, that's when we start seeing the uh, camp improvements. I think this is a e very easy, winnable fight for him. I think this is going to be sober, though. I was going to ask it because I thought that he – didn't he actually die from an overdose and came back on the table? I'm pretty sure he's one of yeah, the – Yeah, that was an thing. So uh, I don't know if he's drinking or not. So if he's not drinking, then what is he – like? I don't uh, – maybe Doughboy eating some pizza, but at the same time, he's a wrestler too, so I mean – yeah, I'm on McKinney, but I get I get the whole idea of like coming off of the relief of being out of a fight, off of a camp, and maybe you let the belly hang out a bit. But I think he I think he's good to go. Um, Nick, I'll let you come in with your spot because I was sort of back in that spot. That was one of my plays as well. Yeah, well, I'm just gonna pick up where I left off. I already did a quick breakdown on this one, but I gotta go with Khalil, uh, Khalil Roundtree. I'm starting to steal your spot. I know that you haven't parlayed up, but. Yeah, man, no. like this is this is my number one spot on the card, man. Because the thing with the Dawkins is like Dawkins doesn't really wrestle. And if I had any sort of inclination that he may come out here and try and shoot, you know, then I may put a little bit more stock into him. But he tends to just be like laborious, just throw kind of stupid hooks. Like I think this weight cut's going to be terrible for him. And Cleo Roundtree is just such a better striker that I don't see where Dawkins wins this. Uh, the line's honestly coming down. It's minus 192 on DraftKings right now. Where I saw it earlier, like yesterday, it was minus 205. So there's money coming in the other way, and I hope that money keeps coming in. Keep coming. Dawkins doesn't like to get hit, man. Dude turns away when he gets hit. Like, sure, he can be a hammer, but he's a horrible nail. Yeah. Um, and I mean – once again, um, you know, what the fuck do I know? I've only been in a handful of fights, but this this guy backs up and turns his head after he's getting hit. And I get it. He was fighting up a weight class and maybe uh, beyond his weight class. But 
I don't know, man. I'm with you on Roundtree. I think he's violence incarnate when he's in there and doing what he needs to do. I know I was, you know, uh, against him in the, you know, the Jacoby fight. And I don't think he won that fight. But, you know, I just think he's going to land here. I think he's going to either have big moments and win a decision that goes, if, if doctors can make it there, that's the worst case scenario. And not, you know, maybe get him out one round, round one or two. Uh, but if the line keeps moving that way, that works for me because Dawkins is uh, sort of a fade at this point. I like the guy. He seems like a good guy, but, um, you know, just didn't want to seem to be in there anymore. So um, what's your thoughts on this one? Uh, I think Dawkins is probably going to get knocked out. This is a pink slip fight. This is uh, – he's got seven fights in the UFC, four and three. So this would be his eighth fight. So if he signed a four-fight contract to start off, from the CFFC, then he probably got resigned after that four fight win streak that he went on. So now this is the back end of his contract. I think he's I think he's gonna get cut after this fight. I yeah, mean, I just think I, I think that's the way we gotta start looking at these uh upcoming cards to end out the summer. Yeah, you're right. right in September is Dana White contender series is here. There's probably gonna be thirty to forty more people in the UFC in the next coming five to six weeks. There's going to be a lot of cuts, and uh, it's going to start off with these uh, Apex cards. 100%. That's a, a great point. There's going to be It's going to be either one way or the other. Can you see a guy biting down on his mouthpiece and fighting for his career and fighting for his contract, or is it really just a setup fight to sort of get him you know, out of here so they can make some room? Um, all right. Let's uh, take a look at another spot. Uh, actually, Billy, I'll let you jump in with another spot. I'm uh, – Mine's going to be on the main event, so I'll wait till we get all the spots out, and I'll drop that one in. Yeah, my uh, second spot here is going to be a favorite. Um, kind of burned me the last time against William Gomez. Uh, Francis Marshall here at minus 160. Um, line's going up a little bit, open up at minus 150, going up to minus 175. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the Diego Lopez line movement from last week. Not the same fight, but the same line movement. Uh, the under here is at minus 146, and that definitely accounts for uh, Isaac Dalgarian's uh, win condition, which is would be in rounds one or two, something early with the flash knockout. But I think Francis Marshall's the more well, well-rounded fighter. Uh, his red flags would be his cardio. And I don't think the cardio is going to be a concern here. I think he actually has better cardio than Dolgarian. So I think he's a deservedly so favorite. Um, eyeing that up as a potential play for this weekend. Yeah, this is one I'll disagree on. Um, with no real conviction, just because like we don't know a lot about Isaac. But I do think Isaac is potentially the better wrestler. Unfortunately, we've never seen him face like a real MMA wrestler like you have with Francis Marshall. But... I feel like if he's able to get him on the ground, like if you go on YouTube where you watch any of this guy's wrestling career, man, like that's all people hype him for. And although they haven't given him the most favorable matchup to come into the UFC, I def like as a dog shot, it's one I'm willing to take on this card. Cause I think this card is going to be relatively favorite heavy. And if he can put Francis Marshall on his back, I don't know if Francis Marshall is going to be able to get back up. You watch this guy's fights, man. And I said, unfortunately the sample size is small, but the second he gets people down, man, he's doing work. So I think he um, beats Francis Marshall on the spot. But once again, like this, there's, there's not enough out there. Maybe I got a hate on for Francis Marshall too. I don't know. My best. I, I, don't, blame you. You a little bit. I don't blame but, you. Though. I was looking to back Isaac Dolgarian against Danny uh, Arguedo when he came in on short notice and ended up pulling out the fight. That's yeah, it's just my, my thing is if he comes in here and he looks as good as what people think he may be, you're not going to get this type of plus money on him again, too. Like they're, they're like the line is dropping. Like it was plus one sixty or plus one fifty down to plus one thirty. So money's still coming back in that way. So I'm going to hit it because if this thing gets anything lower than it is, then I think the value is going to be gone on it. Just because we have the sample size on Marshall, we know what he's capable of doing. Yeah, I'd say the one thing about Marshall is just he has a, he's a motherfucker. He does have that dog in him. Um, and the man, I mean, he, when. He, he gets in the Dana White Kendrick series. He's a wrestler. He gets on with his hands, right? And, I mean, he's always in the fights. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that he could be a favorite. But for me, the reason when I looked at that fight, it was more of a stay off because that last fight just sort of screwed the shit out of me. And I, I didn't want to be on the other side of it, fading him hard. Like, like I don't know if Nick's going to end up being by the end of the week um, or, you know, on the other side, backing him and then get fucked again. So I stayed off it. I want to watch this one. Uh, but I fully see both sides of it, like, as far as a little bit of tape. But um, for me, um, it'll be a stay off completely. 
Uh, All right. Yeah, man. To go into my next spot on this one, this is one that, like, you're going to take shit for Josh Hill. I'm probably going to take shit for this one. But I'm going to ride with Cub Swanson, man. This guy's always been somebody that I can bet on. I said I don't see this being a very dog-friendly card. Like, I think there's a lot of favorites that are just going to come through on this one. And I think this fight's a lot closer than the line suggests. Hakeem's the type of guy that does well whenever he's able to control the pressure. But Cub Swanson, man, whenever he gets into a flow state, he's all there. And if there's one thing that was exposed in the Hakeem fight, it, or in um, the Julian Arosa fight against Hakeem, it's his wrestling. And Cub Swanson is a very well-put-together fighter. And although he's not somebody who uses his wrestling, he has used it in the past. And it's something he always has in his back pocket. So I think if he watches that Julian Arosa fight, I think he can see a clear path to victory. And I think between him and his coaches, they're probably going to come in here a little bit more wrestle-heavy and try and uh, repeat what Julian Arosa was able to do. Yeah, not a bad spot. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I've gone back and forth on that. I mean, is Swanson done? That's the only question for me because I know the power's there. I know he has the striking. He, he is the definition of do that dog in him, and he definitely could start to land, and then you're like, fuck, well, this this is, this line definitely shouldn't have been this wide. So I see the value dog in that 100%. Obviously, I think a lot of people are looking at that like, do I do I look at it? But uh, I, another one, stay off for me because I just don't I, I don't know how that one actually plays out. If Swanson shows up and just starts landing, I'm – you know, I, I don't know what side to be on there. So, uh, what do you think, Bill? <laughs> a little bit nervous. Uh, yeah. Just, just a fight that I'm just looking to stay away from because Akeem Dewadi did not look like himself in his last fight, and uh, I don't know if it's recency bias, but um, I just, I don't know, man. It's just like this is one of those fights where you would have to parlay, and this could be a parlay buster. It really comes like if. if Swanson is still Swanson, and he's still, like, mentally, he still wants to be in there 100%. He's not thinking about retirement. He comes out after a really good camp. As you get older, sometimes you have good camps, bad camps, and the injuries pile up. Sometimes you go into a fight with a bunch of injuries. Sometimes you go into a fight with none, um, or at least moderate amounts. So if he comes in and all the, the recipe is there, then that's what that value on that line is there 100% because I think he has the tools to finish the fight, if not even win rounds. So um, what do you think about even maybe a spread play? I think this is the definition of potential spread play because he could potentially I, knock out Dabadu and or win a round with some volume. Or like he volume, could also some damage volume. I think he'd get knocked out by a game, though. A lot yeah. of times yeah. Swanson's losing, it's usually inside the distance. But Hakeem's been event. going to the D1, right? Like the no, D1 but this is the co main event for a reason. They, they definitely want action and they definitely yeah. want violence. I think this is more of an under spot than after Sanhagen. Dabadu's not coming in with a D1 wrestling game game plan in front of Dana, eh? <laughs> not at all. This Fair is the apex. Yeah. The apex is buzzing this week. You got to think about it. Dana White Contender Series is on Tuesday night. Wednesday night is a Paris is when the power slap uh contest in the apex, and then Saturday is oh. going to be right back in the apex again with the UFC fight card. So, uh Dana's got a lot of money invested this weekend, and uh, he wasn't too happy going out to Nashville. So I definitely think he wants uh, some violence this week. Much respect, Corey Sanding. You do you, motherfucker. Don't worry about anybody else. Cash that check. Um, all right, I'm going to come in with my final spot. Um, Rafael Dos Andros against Vicente Luque. Um, I just remember watching Luque's last fight and just thinking, wow, he's hittable. Like, I know he lands. I know he's dangerous. And I know he lands. Like, I looked at the volumes about five to three. So we have Luke landing about five, five and a half shots, whatever the hell it is, to about three. So we have a lower volume in Dos Andros. But, I mean, Luke just gets hit nonstop. And I know that Dos Andros isn't much better on the defensive striking. But being lower volume, there's less opportunity for him to get hit in most cases, the way the matchup will line up. I think he's going to be able to counter him. I think he's going to be able to land some of the, the bigger shots just being – I just think that Luke is going to go in wild again, too. I think he's going to get hit. He's hit, like his head lives on the center line with full respect. Like, like it lives on the center line. I'm a, I love Vicente Luque, been backed him in the past, but it just lives there and it scares the shit out of me. I know on the ground, he, you know, is scary with his, his submissions as well, too. But I mean, against Kieso with a neck choke, I don't know how much value that has anymore at this point. I think he even admitted that that's his, you know, kryptonite. So, I just think those angels on the ground has always been a go-to. I think his his neck chokes are fucking devastating. I think that his wrestling is dominant. And I think that even if it does go to decision and these guys have sort of like basically negated each other a little bit, I think those angels edges him. And I think that uh, he has the bigger moments because Luke just doesn't show punches well. He doesn't 
you know, it just doesn't look good. So I'll take the minus 130 on Los Angeles also, too, because it's just at the moments that I have, um, you know, backed him, it, it's been cashing. It was a ROI situation, and I got to sort of go to that and trust it. Um, but I get it fully if people are on the Luque side because he is damaged. He could finish the fight in, in multiple ways, but it's just the him getting hit and how it looks if it does go to those judges' scorecards. I think Los Angeles uh, takes the vet um, win. But uh, what do you, what's your guys' take on this one? I'm not going to be touching any props in this. Minus 130 hit. That's it. Money line. If the line gets better for you and you're on the Dos Angeles side, do your thing. But uh, I know I'll be faded by some people, but I'm going to go with the, the vet and Dos Angeles. Yeah, I actually like Vincente Luque in this spot. Um, I think this is a little bit of a undervalued spot for him. Uh, he just didn't have a good 2022 year. I mean, he lost two fights. Um, the Jeff Neal fight was a dog fight. Got his ass whooped in that one. And I just think it was a product of the year. Sometimes when you're in the fight game and you're in the game for so long and it's like seven, eight years and stuff like that, and you're starting to go on the rise, it's some years you're going to go 3-0, and oh, other years you're going to go 0-2. Oh, That's just the way it goes after you fight a lot of fights. And uh, I just don't think Rafael Dos Anjos is uh, somebody that I'm afraid to fade. I mean, he's going to try to go out here, strike a little bit, mix it up with the takedowns. And I just don't think he's going to be able to get the takedowns of Vicente Luque. If Vicente Luque has a good takedown defense, and even if he does get taken to the ground, he has a sneaky submission game. We've seen that against Michael Chiesa before. Uh, so I, I like Vicente Luque plus 100. Nice little dog shot to end out the night. Uh, I'm right there with you, though. I don't want to get cute with the prop angles on this one. Yeah, there's no point. Because these guys, I mean, I get what you're saying. I totally get your side. Like, some guy, times fighters have bad runs, and what he has shown at his best is still uh, there to be had, right? So, but uh, yeah, no, I get it, and we could be on either side of it. And I think that over minus 150, then I'm not really a fan of those angles at the point. I don't see the value in the line. I like it under minus 150, and, and that's where I see the value on it because I, I could see these guys fighting 10 times and one guy finishing one a couple times, one guy finishing another a couple times. But like I said, I still see the edge on one side, you see the edge on the other. Nick, what do you see? Um, I see this being a perfect live betting fight. I don't think anybody can go into this fight with real confidence on any which way it's going to go. Both guys haven't looked the greatest as of late. And, well, RDA maybe a little more than Vicente Luque. But what are we talking about? He, he, like, sorry, I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta cut you off. As of late, he's looked great. He's only got, the only fight where he, he got sort of L-class was disease. And that's like possibly one of the best strikers in, in MMA right now. No, nope. that, that, that's fair. That's fair. I'm just – what I mean by that I'm is like – No, no, it's good. It's like I was, I was more looking back at like the Brian Barbarina fight where that was just like a complete setup fight. And it's just – the thing with Vicente Luque, man, is like – I said it's either going to come out, he's going to have the dog in him or he's not. And like I said, like I've looked at this fight back and forth. I do lean RDA as well. Um, I think there's a reason why the line isn't moving that much either way though because I think people are sitting yeah. here like me going back and forth being like – like I said, I'll probably lie about this fight because it's an even money fight. You're going to be able to get value either way. And I think if RDA comes out, starts landing takedowns, or just kind of gets into like a decent state of striking, you're going to see where he's at. And if Vicente Luque comes out and just cracks him, and you see RDA, like you'll see in that facial expression if he doesn't want to be there whenever he starts getting hit by a guy like Vicente Luque. Mm -hmm. And I think you could probably swing the other way. So but I don't have a clue what's going to happen in this fight. <laughs> Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. One hundred percent. You can't tell me though, event. Vicente Luque is not one of the most like dangerous like fighters. I think a potential way to go about this, if you don't like either of the sides, could be the under. I think we might see an under in this main event. Maybe a RDA on the ground or a uh, Vicente Luque knockout. I think these two boys are going to want to prove a point. I mean, if you look at RDA's career. He's at that point right now where every fight counts towards the end of your career. I mean, if you think you want to make this one last push, that's the only reason why he puts on the gloves. It's either now or never. If it's if you're Vicente Luque, you're on an 0-2 run after uh, kind of being built up by the UFC. So it's either now or never. So uh, I could definitely see uh, this fight being a sneaky under if people are going to take money on the over. How is Vicente Luque only 31? That's what I'm saying, man. He's got a lot more. He's got he's got a run in him, man. And I think this could be the start of the run, man. I I thought these guys were similar in age. I was I just looked at that now and I was like, what the fuck? Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward, though, on this card, man. Like, I think McGee is probably my favorite fight this week. I think he's just going to come out here and ragdoll JP Bias. Problem is, once again, he's a minus 400, so what do you really do with that? Um, but I, as I said, man, I think this card's going to be relatively favorite heavy. Like, I think Luana Santos just completely destroys Juliana Miller. I don't know why people are betting on that side. I think that I feel she's- like that for the Ream fight against uh, Maseret Ruiz. I know Ruiz is cashing big dog tickets for people in the past, and uh, everybody likes the net tax. But uh, I feel like that girl, Ream, on that Easter card of Israel Asanya in prayer, uh, we backed her against Sam Hughes. And yeah. granted, she lost the fight, but she, she almost submitted her in the first round. It, who's to say she doesn't submit this girl in the first or second round? Uh, I think they're giving her another shot at a winnable fight. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Um, also, like Martin Boudet a lot. Minus 218, yeah. minus 200 a little chalky, but I think Josh Parisian is absolutely awful, man. I think it's going to be a good fight. It's going to be a greasy heavyweight fight, but I'm fairly confident in Boudet in this one. Yeah, and I'm like, right here with you. And I like AJ as a dog slightly. Minus pl- uh, plus plus one twenty five. Yeah, I like I like that one. I just want to see the weigh ins for that one. Uh, you know, Tafan fighting at this weight class, he's cutting a lot of weight. AJ Dobson. Uh, I just want to see. I just want to see those two face off, so my eyes can confirm it. If I lose a little bit of the ten cents on the line on the dog, so be it. But uh, I just want to see a little bit more information. Maybe watch a couple of interviews, see where both fighters' heads are at, because. Uh, I, I like the dog shot potentially in that one too. Marcus McGee minus four thirty. Um, that price tag kind of shocked me, but then once you really dig into the fight, I definitely would agree with you on that one. And then uh, the last fight I wanted to ask you about: What are your opinions on this Josh Frum Jamie Pickett line? Is Josh Frum really supposed to be thirty ten? I think Jamie Pickett's absolutely terrible. He's but terrible, but man, it's Josh a little, minus two ten. But if you look at Fred, man, when he took that fight on short notice against uh, Hernandez, he looked good in that fight, man. And Hernandez, to me, is the real deal. He did look good in that fight. That was the fight that kind of, like, confirmed uh, maybe the 310 price tag is deservedly so. Maybe uh, – I don't always say this, but maybe this uh, – this fight kind of reminds me of um, Evan Elder a couple of weeks ago when he was uh, minus 300 versus Gernaldo Valdez – and granted, that fight was a little bit greasy, but he ended up pulling out the W. I think that could be potentially the same as – not the same exact way the fight goes, but I'm saying like the same exact way the uh, – I, I could see Josh from winning a fight and it just not being that impressive of a performance. For sure. And honestly, though, I don't know why. Like, what did Jamie Pickett do to the UFC? Because they gave him bone nickel, and then instead of like giving him like another warm-up fight that he can win – they give him Josh Fram, who's pretty much going to come out here. And, like, Josh Fram is great wrestling as well. His striking is on point. Like, they didn't really do him any favors in the spot at all. Well, it's pink slip season, man. Dana White yes, can man. pops off tomorrow night. We're going to start uh, – half of these fighters that are on this card this weekend, we won't see in the USC ever again. So, it's that time of year. Yeah, Jamie Pickett's on a four-fight losing streak – or a three-fight losing streak and probably four after this. So, I'd be very surprised if he uh, – if he – uh, it's still in the UFC after this one. Yeah, I don't blame you. Uh, that, those are all the spots I was really looking at for this weekend. And I will agree with you. Um, seems like more of a parlay type of card with uh, some of these price tags being a little bit juiced. Um, like the Ream line, I saw that at minus 200 last night, and it's going up to 265. So probably parlay that up with something. And uh, that's really everything on the UFC card for this weekend, to be honest with you. But first, it's your boy, Billy Briz. Uh, my three spots for this weekend starts in the Dana White Contender Series. We're going with the main event, Fernando, on the money line at minus 225. And then for this weekend, we're looking at Terrence McKinney inside a distance at minus 210, but probably play a KO prop to uh, get better value on the minus 330 line and a potential parlay piece for him. And the other leg that we are looking at for this weekend is is Francis Marshall on the money line, but Nick kind of got me a little bit thinking about the other side, about how the dog could win in that fight. And then last pick, me and Kyle were going against each other in the main event, uh, Vicente Luque versus Rafael Dos Anjos. Make sure you guys comment on the video below who do you guys think is going to win on the main event. 
And, and for my three spots, man, I'm going Cleo Roundtree as the top of my ticket this week. I just think that Dawkins is going to have nothing. And as Billy said, man, this is pink slip season. And Dawkins isn't going to be in the UFC much longer. Um, I'm picking a fairly large dog shot on Cub Swanson this week at plus 195. As the line continues to uh, go down, I'm probably going to hit it sooner rather than later. I just think this line's wide, man, and if I see value, you don't got to be right every single time when you take the big dog shots. You just got to be right sometimes. And for the last um, spot of the week, um, I didn't get too much into it, but uh, Marcus McGee is the top ticket for me this week. And I already have a parlay with Marcus McGee and uh, Khalil Roundtree wrapped up. Yeah, what is the uh, odds on that parlay for this weekend? Uh, sec. Yeah, I was looking at a potential Marcus McGee and uh, Terrence McKinney money line parlay. It just seems like a spot that the UFC is like. If Terrence McKinney doesn't win this fight, wow, I would be I would be shocked if he doesn't win this fight. And that's it, right? It's like he needs to win this fight. Uh, it's in that minus one eleven, so okay, we're pretty much almost getting lost pick. money. Good little pick them to get your uh, get paid on the day. But um, till next time, make sure you're tuned into Don't Tap Podcast. <laughs>